We are so pleased to welcome, I know we have so many students, University of Montana students here, we have community members here, we have faculty here, we have staff here. Um, welcome to the University of Montana. I'm Kelly Webster, I'm the Chief of Staff here at the University and I have the lucky pleasure of not only welcoming all of you uh, to this evening's conversation with President Kashkari, um, but also I have the lucky job of introducing two huge brains who are sitting up here with us. Um, I want to, you may not be aware, I think this is, I think many of you might know this, but some of you I think this is a nice educational opportunity. You might not be aware that our nation's central bank quiz, does anyone know when it was first created? What year? You better know. <laughs> Over here. You got it, 1913. So um, this, our nation's central bank was created by US Congress in 1913. And of course, it has the not inconsequential task of helping us manage the vicissitudes of the ups and downs of our economic, the US economy and our economic landscape. I think all with the intention of helping to foster the eco economic well-being of all Americans. So it's a it's a big job. Um, we have the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is one of 12 regional reserve banks in the US. And Montana is one of six states represented by President Kashkari's region. Did I get that right? You did. Yeah. Um, his time here with us, I think, is just one expression of his and his colleagues' commitment to listening well enough on the ground and in our communities to really be able to steward um, the US economy and to make good decisions that are good for all of us, not just um, for the folks who are in DC. So we deeply appreciate your time here in Montana and um, President Kashkari comes out to Montana on occasion. Um, so as we begin this moderated opportunity for conversation, I wanna provide <coughs> a proper introduction to both of you. So I'm gonna start with our Moderator, many of you know the peerless Bryce Ward. Um, Bryce Ward will be moderating this evening. He's the founder of ABMJ Consulting and formerly served as Associate Director at the Bureau of Business and Economic Research here at the University of Montana. He has a PhD in economics from Harvard University and BAs in economics and history from the University of Oregon. Go Ducks. Uh, he has expansive expertise, so you can listen to this list, in urban and regional economics, labor economics, health economics, public finance, social economics, real estate economics, environmental and natural resource economics, and statistics and econometrics. Uh, Bryce has taught as faculty at Harvard University, at Lewis and Clark College, the University of Oregon and Portland State. He's published dozens of articles, scholarly articles and economic reports. Um, and he has provided expert testimony in dozens of court cases and legislative proceedings. And I thought this was a pretty neat fact about Bryce. He was the first person to use Facebook data for scholarly research. Curious what that was for, what that article was. Um, his research has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Associated Press, PBS NewsHour, NPR, ProPublica, among others. And I think most notable, if you are a part of the Missoula community, you have heard Bryce speak on topics that help us as Montanans make better decisions to help ensure all Montanans can thrive. So really appreciative of your time here, Bryce. And our guest of honor. Neil Kashkari has been president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis since January 1st of 2016. He serves as a member on the Federal Open Market Committee, bringing the 9th Federal Reserve District's perspective to monetary policy discussions in Washington, D.C. In addition, he oversees Minneapolis Fed operations and leads its many initiatives. He was instrumental in establishing the very admirable <coughs> Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute, whose mission is to ensure that world-class research, I know some of our economics faculty are in the room, that world-class research helps to improve the economic well-being of all Americans. 
Most recently, he supported the expansion of the Center for Indian Country Development, which advances the prosperity of native nations and indigenous communities through actionable data and research. And you may know that one of our regents for the, on the Board of Regents for the Montana University System helps to lead that center, Casey Lozar. So we're very close to home for us. Neil earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois. He became an aerospace engineer, uh, developing technology for NASA missions. Eventually turning to finance and public policy, he earned his MBA from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School, joined Goldman Sachs, and served in several <coughs> senior positions at the US Department of Treasury, including overseeing the Trouble Assets Relief Program, or TARP, during the financial crisis. Before joining the Minneapolis Fed, he spent four years at PIMCO, and then in 2014, he ran for governor of California on a platform focused on economic op opportunity. We are really grateful to have you here with us this evening to help us navigate what I know is a complex world um, and all the things that we're reading about and hearing about in the news. Um, also very grateful that you commit to having time on the ground with the people you serve. So I will hand it over to Bryce and President Kashkari. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Kelly. Uh, it's great to be here. Often that's a bit of a vacuous statement at an event like this, but given that there was apparently some chance the world was going to end this afternoon, I'm very happy to still be here. Um, you know, uh, I'm particularly happy given that I'm somehow still alive in my March Madness pool. So, you know, what a real, real bummer to, you know, lose out on that opportunity to finally win after how many years of playing. But uh, Anyhow, uh, I'm also very happy to be here to be able to have this uh, meaningful discussion with President Kaskari. Welcome, President Kaskari. Please call me Neil. Neil, by the way. welcome. A lot easier Neil. for both of us. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so before I get into my random questions and our random questions from the audience, do you, any, do you have anything you want to say? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you uh, for first of all the wonderful introduction. Thank you, Bryce, for being here. Uh, thanks to all of you for such a great turnout. I love visiting Montana. I always have a lot of fun. People are very warm and hospitable. Kelly gave a great introduction about the Federal Reserve. And I wanted to spend a couple minutes and talk about why I'm here uh, to build on what she said. So in 1913, uh, the Congress created the Federal Reserve and did something unique. They created these 12 independent Federal Reserve banks, these 12 different districts. So just as Kelly said, our jobs at the Minneapolis Fed are to represent all of you. So we spent a lot of our time, my colleagues and I, traveling around the region to understand what's happening in our regional economy. It's a big region. Montana, the Dakotas, Minnesota, part of Michigan, part of Wisconsin, very diverse region. And then I take this regional economic insights and I go back to Washington, D.C. every six weeks for what are called Federal Open Market Committee meetings, FOMC meetings. You may see it on TV or read about it in the newspaper, where we set interest rates for the nation. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, we cannot set a different interest rate for Montana and for New York and for California. We all use the same dollar. So it's one monetary policy for the country as a whole. But my job and my colleagues' jobs are to make sure that this region is represented in that deliberative process. So how do we get this insight? Part of what we do is we come out and we meet from folks like you to hear firsthand what's happening on the ground. And then we also have a board of directors. We have a Helena branch office of uh, people who work in Helena, Montana. We have a board of directors of our Helena branch, all of whom represent our economy. And many of our uh, directors are here today. I'm happy to see them here. They go out, like every six weeks, we ask them, go out and call your contacts. What's happening in your corner of Montana? Bring that information together, bring it to us, and then we distill it and bring it back to Washington, D.C. So I'm grateful for all of you turning out tonight. I'm really looking forward to having a very rich discussion. I'm going to answer questions uh, from Bryce and from all of you, but I also am looking forward to hearing from you about what's happening here on the ground. I've spent my day here. I met with, um, first of all, I went up to the Rocky Mountain Lab to learn about the research that they're doing there, which was very interesting. Uh, met with business owners this afternoon. Uh, spent some time over lunch with your uh, very bright university president here who I've had the chance to meet with before. There's a lot of excitement going on here. 
and not without challenges, which I've heard about before and will continue to hear about. But overall, things seem like they're going quite well in Montana. Uh, I know, you know people have different experiences, so that's a blanket statement. But overall, it seems like things are moving in the right direction, uh, which I'm excited to dig into some more. So thank you for uh, inviting me here. Thank you for turning out tonight. Great turnout. And I'm looking forward to our discussion. All right. So uh, before we get back to, to your, the role in the Federal Reserve, let's just get, you know, let the audience get to know you a little bit. Uh, there's a longtime radio host uh, who used to start all of his programs with the same question. Uh, so I'm going to pose it to you, okay. uh, which is, where did you grow up and what did your parents do? I grew up in Akron, Ohio. Uh, my parents have since passed, but my mother was a physician and my father was a professor of electrical engineering. And, you know, you, you see your parents as, a, you know, they open your eyes to possibilities. I went into engineering and my sister became a doctor. So, you know, we didn't fall very far, far from the tree, though I navigated away when I eventually went into finance and business. Yeah, you didn't grow up wanting to be a Fed president. I'm not sure anybody grew up know what it was. to do that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So what does a Fed president do? Well, there's three parts of the role of a Fed president. Um, one part is management. So we have 1,100 employees at the Minneapolis Fed. You may not know this. The Federal Reserve Banks do a lot of different things. So we, do, we have a team of economists. Our chief economist is here with me, Andrea Raffo. They study the national, regional, and global economy to try to understand where the economy is going. We supervise banks in our region to make sure that banks are being operated in a safe and sound manner. We also manage and process cash on behalf of the U.S. Treasury Department. So each of the Federal Reserve Banks has a big vault. We have some very well-trained law enforcement officers protecting that vault. And uh, if you take out money from your ATM, that money would have started out at a Federal Reserve Bank. And then we have these giant machines that take cash that come in from banks and then process that cash. And then some of the old bills, the machines detect and shred that cash and then replace it with new bills to get out into the economy. So we do a bunch of different stuff under the Federal Reserve Bank. So long answer to your question. A third of my job is management. A third of my job is working with our PhD economists to understand where the economy is going and take insights like I'm going to get from all of you. You know, we, we look at this national data, and the national data is often confusing. And then I take that and I marry it with, well, this is what I'm hearing on the ground from our directors or from our contacts that I meet with to try to make sense of where the economy is going. And then a third of my job is getting out and communicating, like with all of you, like I'm doing here tonight, or interviews with the media, or meeting with our elected leaders to be able to share, this is what the Federal Reserve is doing on behalf of the public that we are charged to serve. So it's quite a, it's quite a diverse job that makes it interesting for me, and I think is a pretty good fit for my background and my skills. So let's dive into the middle portion of that, because I think that's the thing that most often people, I think, care about You know, when they hear about the Fed. They want to know what you're doing with monetary policy, sure. because that's the management of the economy piece. So just to, yeah, I guess a little background to make sure people understand. Uh, you know, so the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve Act 1913, uh, you know, creates the Fed and says, well, we call it a dual mandate, but technically there's three parts to it. You know, maximum employment, stable prices, and kind of moderate interest rates, right? So why are those the goals and how do you guys balance the, because you can't go all the way in on one or the other of them. How do you try and achieve the balance between them? So what we've defined is, uh, as our goals, maximum employment, let's take that first. As many Americans as possible, gainfully employed and contributing to our economy. So maximum, as many as possible. And then second goal, stable prices, what we define as 2% inflation. And we typically think that these two things are like sides of a seesaw. When the economy gets really strong and the unemployment rate drops, more people are working, which is good news. So we're getting the maximum employment. But then businesses have to compete with each other to find workers. That leads to wages going up. That leads to prices going up. So then the seesaw gets imbalanced. So then in that situation, we would traditionally raise interest rates to try to tap the brakes on the economy to bring inflation back down, but that might weaken the job market a little bit. And that's traditionally how we try to trade off the, those two fundamental sides of our dual mandate. Okay, so obviously the last four years economically in terms of those mandates have been a little wild. Uh, we've seen first the initial COVID shock, you know, plummeting employment rates coming out of COVID. You know, for people our age, really our first experience with inflation as adults, 
Um, and now we have interest rates that are much higher than, you know, again, if you're in your middle age period than really anything you've kind of seen in a long time. Um, so let's talk about inflation a little bit. So how did inflation get so high in 2022, 2023? What led to that? And why then did it fall? Uh, you know, how has it been falling for the last year or so? Yeah, it really surprised us. It caught us off guard that inflation got as high as it did, as quickly as it did. And with the benefit of hindsight, the best explanation that I can have is that a lot of different things hit the economy at the same time. So when COVID hit, you all remember this, supply chains got severely disrupted, right? Semi there were semiconductor shortages, shortages of all sorts of different products, which we had not experienced in recent decades. At the same time that the services economy was largely shut. So you, people weren't going out to restaurants, the restaurants were largely closed. They weren't getting on planes or going to hotels. So people were spending way more on goods than they had historically spent on. And yet many of those goods were the same goods whose supply chains were disrupted. And there was a lot of stimulus put to try to support the economy all at the same time. And then Mr. Putin decided to invade Ukraine, which upended commodity markets. Oil prices, commodity prices went through the roof. All of those things hit roughly around the same time, and each one of those by itself was inflationary, combined those four, and it led to a big spike in inflation very, very quickly. Traditionally, you know, the thing I just told you a few minutes ago about the seesaw between the labor market and inflation, that's a model where labor drives inflation. What I just described to you about COVID was not labor driving inflation. It was all of these supply factors driving inflation that's why we were caught off guard, because we were used to studying the labor market to try to understand inflation. This inflation came from somewhere totally different. So given that it came from somewhere totally different, um, does that mean you have to think about your policy levers differently? It does. So in the second half, the latter half of last year, we saw inflation fall much quicker than we had expected, which is a good thing. Really happy about that. And we've seen the labor market remain very strong, which is also a good thing, really happy about that. But that surprised us that we've seen that much disinflation and such a strong labor market. What's the explanation for that? Most of the progress that we've made in inflation has been because those supply factors have unwound. People have come back to work. Most supply chains have gotten better. The services economy has reopened, so people have started spending on services not overloading the goods sector all at the same time. So, and oil prices went way up, came back down. They're, they're kind of creeping up again, but basically commodity prices have come back down to normal relative to when Russia invaded Ukraine. So those supply factors unwound and you saw inflation fall back down, not all the way back down to where we wanted to, but a lot of the way back down. But we're still above. We're right? still above. Still above about a percentage point. Yeah, we're you know. running around a 3% rate. We want to be at 2. Okay, so how, how big of a problem is that? Well, we got to get it back down to 2. Um, one of the funny things about economics is that people's expectation, your expectation for the future becomes self-fulfilling. So if all of us believe that inflation is going to be 2%, then we behave in a way that helps lead to inflation being 2%. If all of us believe that inflation is going to be 3% for the foreseeable future, then we all behave in a different way and it leads to inflation being 3%. So one of the, the resources that the Fed had is we'd built up a lot of credibility going into the shock. So people had confidence, yeah, we're seeing this high inflation, but we believe the Fed is serious about getting it back down. That helped us get it back down as far as we, but we ought to go all the way. Because if we stop short, then you all are going to say, well, maybe they're going to stop short next time and then that undermines confidence in the Fed. So we do need to get it all the way back down, and my colleagues and I are committed to doing so. Okay, so now let's flip to the other side of the mandate, the employment side. Um, so nationally, it's been pretty strong, and locally it's also been pretty strong uh, here in western Montana, here in Missoula. Um, but I was at a basketball game, one of my daughter's basketball games a few weeks ago, and a friend who's kind of connected in the business community comes up to me and he's like, the world is ending, right? You know, I'm hearing about all these employers that are closing. Uh, then, you know, within a week, I think both of the last two sawmills in town announced that they were closing. Uh, but at the same time, we opened up an Amazon facility. You know, so there's this tension in the economy. Now, 
here in Montana, uh, the, or in Missoula, the unemployment rate is up over a percentage point year over year. Um, if I look at, you know, there's like 21 states where uh, unemployment has spiked by more than half a percent relative to the 12 month low, the SOM rule. Um, so we're starting to see a little bit more unevenness, but the national number is still good. So how do you think about the normal churn? You know, how much is, uh, you know, geographic dispersion is there allowed to be in terms of, because again, as you mentioned, we only get one interest rate for the, whole for the whole economy. You know, where does that balance lie on the employment side? What are you looking at on the employment side? Are you, I mean, again, we got a great national jobs report yeah. last Friday, but are you starting, is there any concern about the employment side of the economy yet? Well, we are seeing most businesses that I talk to around our region report that the labor market is not red hot the way it was a year ago or two years ago, which was just crazy hot, and they had to keep paying up to keep their workers in place, let alone trying to find new workers. So it's not that red hot, but it's still a tight labor market. They're still having to compete to find workers. I mean, the roundtable of businesses I did this afternoon did not make it sound like, boy, this is like their workers anywhere they can go, they can go find whoever they need. They still have to work hard. They still have to compete to find workers. So. And for as long as I've been at the Fed, so now this is my ninth year, Montanans have largely reported, hey, we need more workers. Like M Montana is structurally short of workers. That's what I've been hearing consistently for nine years. So I would be really surprised if you told me that, hey, the Montana economy now has enough workers. I see a lot of heads nodding. Uh, so that makes me think that, I mean, there will be regional variations. There will be variations within Montana itself, and people will shuttle around to go to where the jobs are. My gut tells me, based on everything that I'm hearing, that the Montana job market is still favorable for workers. Okay, so uh, we're going to turn this over to the audience. I'm going to have some, one more question. This is my warning to you guys to start, if you have questions, you know, start prepping them. Oh, um, and by the way, if you disagree with what you're hearing me say, I want to hear that too, because it'll help me become smarter about what's happening here on the ground. So one last question about your you know, uh, role as Fed president. Um, you know, stepping outside of the normal macroeconomic policy, Kelly mentioned in her, her intro that one of the things you started when you came to the Minneapolis Fed was the Opportunity and Inclusive Gro Growth Institute. Um, our president, when he talks, he always talks about the University of Montana as a mechanism for inclusive prosperity. Um, so given that Montanans hear about a lot, why did you choose to start the Minneapolis Fed? What, or why did you do the, the OIGI? Yeah. You know, what, are they do, what are they doing? Um, you, know, uh, you know, yeah. So uh, Minnesota has some of the worst uh, economic disparities in the country. You know, Minnesota overall, Minnesotans are very proud of their economic prosperity. But if you go beneath the surface, there's some big gaps. Uh, and of course, if you go under Native American reservations, it's a, it's a whole other uh, gap, uh, structural gap. And as I started asking questions of our brilliant economists that we have in the Federal Reserve, why do some of these gaps exist? Why are they so persistent? I was surprised at how little we knew. And what I realized is that you know, we may not have all the tools at the Federal Reserve to solve all of these problems. We do have tremendous research capabilities. And so it occurred to me that we needed a dedicated research effort to study some of these structural barriers, some of these gaps to illuminate them, to understand them, and then maybe to equip either Federal Reserve policymakers or state officials or federal legislators with the data and the analysis that they needed uh, to try to improve the lives, the outcomes of some of our fellow Americans. So that's, we identified a need, and now five or six years in, I think the Institute's doing really good work. All right, so I'll pause there. Uh, we have a couple of microphones. Uh, if somebody wants to ask a question, uh, raise your hand. Wait for the microphone so that everybody can hear you. Anybody? And, and do me a favor and introduce yourself when, you, when we do. Here in the middle. And by the way, just a, a disclaimer, we're live streaming this. So just so you know, the world is going to hear you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, President Kashkari. Uh, my question is this, uh, the Minneapolis Fed generated a position paper a number of years ago on state-funded early childhood education. Uh, the Montana Department of Labor reports that about 27,000 Montanans, primarily women, are out of the workforce currently because of the lack of available child care. So could you talk about the economic impacts as you contemplate uh, the labor market and what states like Montana might do to improve their standing in that regard? Yeah, so uh, years ago, the Minneapolis Fed did this research just that you referenced, 
that looked at, you know, is there a payback to governments investing in early childhood education for, especially for lower income families? And the payback, were, the results were overwhelmingly positive, that there's a very positive payback return to society, return to taxpayers by getting um, kids in high quality early childhood education. And you know, as I have a, I'm a parent, I'm an old dad relatively with young children. I have a five-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son. So my wife and I are in the throes of the childcare experience. And we're fortunate that we can afford to pay for very high quality, very high quality early care for our children. Not everybody is so fortunate. But this is a, this is a pickle. Like it took me a while to understand the economics of this because most child care centers struggle to find the workers they need because the wages are so low. So how can it be so expensive for families and yet the wages are so low? What's going on? And it took me a while to understand this. And of course, if you pay the workers more then, so that they have a livable wage, then the families, fewer families can afford to pay it because it very, very quickly it becomes, doesn't make sense for both parents to work. Might as well have one parent stay at home just based on the economics of this. And so I finally realized that this is like agriculture. Like, virtually every country in the world subsidizes agriculture. Why do they do that? Because they want high prices for farmers and low prices for consumers. Those two things are directly in conflict. The only way you can have both at the same time is with subsidies. That's what I realized is true for childcare. If you want uh, decent wages for childcare workers and, a, and affordability for most families, those two things are directly in conflict. And the only way you can achieve both at the same time is with subsidies. And so I'm not here to advocate for subsidies. I'm just laying out the math. That the math is if you want both of those at the same time, you, the market cannot deliver that. It's impossible. Um, and so what our analysis at the Minneapolis Fed said is if those subsidies are directed at families that otherwise could not afford it, then there are disproportionate returns to society for making sure that those children get that early start in education uh, that they would not otherwise get. I don't know if I answered your question. Sorry, it was a long answer, but this was, took me a while to figure out what's going on here. It's a very complicated topic. Since we're talking <clears throat> about children, I heard this in one of your, I was listening to some of your previous ones of these things. Your children are named Uli and Tecumseh. Uli and Tecumseh, Uli and Tecumseh. yeah. Will you want to share with the audience how, how you came up yeah. with those names? So Yuli, her, her actual name is Ulysses. Um, uh, Ulysses S. Grant and Tecumseh Sherman, the Civil War generals that uh, took, by the way, William Tecumseh Sherman, his original name was Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, he was given the name William later. Um, my wife, uh, I'm a history junkie, and Ulysses S. Grant is one of my heroes from history. And my wife and I were debating for names for our daughters. Now, my wife is from the Philippines. And I told her, I said, boy, I wish if we were having a boy, I'd want to name him Ulysses. And she said, Ulysses, and I've never heard that name before. I kind of like it for a girl. And I said, done. OK, the <laughs> next, next question. So the nice thing is it abbreviates to Yuli, which we think is very cute for a girl. And uh, anyway. A bit more meaningful than what I did with one of my children, which was create little uh, a program which combined all the different one-syllable sounds. Um, <laughs> Hi, Maisie. That's how you got your name. Uh, we like that one. Uh, anyhow, uh, questions from the audience over here. You only have two questions for you, both equally important. My name is Ryan. Thanks for being here. First, who do you have in the game tonight? <laughs> UConn, Purdue. Uh, I'm an engineer, so I got to go with Purdue. OK. All right. Uh, second question, you just mentioned that the Fed doesn't have the tools that you would prefer or you, you say you worded that you, that you would need to fix that gap, that, that economic gap. What tools would you add if you could to be able to fix that gap? Well, I'll just give you an example. I mean, the gaps that exist in society are caused by a lot of different things. So education gaps. We were talking about early childhood education. You know, we're not the Department of Education. We don't have funding, et cetera. We just set interest rates and we supervise banks. But, and there, there are huge gaps in access to quality education. There are huge gaps in, from the earliest years of life all the way K through 12, all the way to college, et cetera. So there are policies that can improve uh, access to quality education as an example. That's why I say we can, we can do analysis that says what are leading to some of these gaps but we may not have the tools to actually address those gaps. That would be up to 
local governments or state governments or the federal government. Education is an example of that. Uh, there are health care gaps, of course, in society too, uh, especially in uh, rural communities may not have access to the care that they need uh, because they just can't, uh, there's not enough density to support a major hospital. And so how do you get the access to the care that you need? These are things that the Fed are, are far outside of the scope of our ability to provide, but we certainly can analyze some of these structural factors that are leading to some of these disparities. Thanks. Up here. My bracket depends on UConn, so I'll be rooting for them. <laughs> My name is Mason. I'm a finance and management information systems uh, major at the university here. Uh, for the last several years, the Minneapolis Fed has put out some communications regarding carbon credits and carbon offsets. I'm curious, given how many states that you represent uh, that are agricultural in nature, um, from a regulatory standpoint, you view that as a viable option for loan collateralization for some of our community and regional banks. So that's news to me. Andrea, do you, are you aware of this? Are, are you sure of the Minneapolis Fed and not another different Fed? It, it's from the late 2000s, but there, there were just a few articles that were put out. I see. Um, I don't, so I, I haven't studied it. Um, climate change, I, I take seriously. I think it's a real issue. We have not done a lot of research into climate change, only because it is not obvious to me that we at the Minneapolis Fed have some special expertise to bring to bear on this subject, so I apologize. I'm not familiar with the research uh, papers that you're referring to, but we'd be happy to follow up with you. Oh. Hi. Hi, my name is Tegan, a uh, recent graduate of the University of Montana, and my question is, we always hear 2% is the target inflation rate, but is there an equivalent target unemployment rate, especially given that not having a job is extremely hard in the U.S.? Um, and yeah. if not, why not? <clears throat> well, that's a great question. And that's why we say price stability, we've defined it as 2%, and then maximum employment, as opposed to full employment. So if you said full employment, for most economists, they have some number in their mind of what does full employment mean? Is 4%? There's always people coming in and out of the job market. So if once you get to, let's say, you thought it was 4%, okay, 4% is full employment, good enough. Maximum means as many as possible. So I interpret that to mean we want the job market to be as strong as possible, to draw as many people in as possible in a manner that's consistent with our 2% inflation target. And I'll know that we're going too far if it's leading to higher inflation. So to me, actually, those two goals end up being linked. And I'll kind of know we're at maximum employment when at steady state we're also at 2% inflation. It, it's, a, it's a complicated linkage, but maximum as I interpret it, maximum means as many as possible because just as you said, the benefits of working are profound. The, the cost and the downside of not being able to find a job are profound. So just follow up on that. Let's flip it around. Sure. So uh, what are the downsides of inflation? Why, why, why balance it? Why not just allow it to be 3%? Well, um, one of the things I think we all learned in, recent, in the last three or four years, the American people hate inflation. Right? I mean, hate it. Uh, more so than I think I realized. I mean, I knew high inflation was bad conceptually, but I, I do most of the grocery shopping for my family. And when I go to the grocery store, it still kills me at what prices are relative to what they were four years ago, right? And they're not going to go back. In most cases, they're not going back. We're just trying to stop them from climbing further from here. And that's what we mean by getting inflation back down. And so uh, there are real costs to inflation. And then for businesses, if you don't know, and we heard about this today. We did, we did a roundtable with businesses. You talk to developers who are saying, well, I'm going to be building a new, uh, uh, a new factory, and I need to buy steel for that factory, and I'm going to pay for that steel when the steel gets delivered nine months from now. But I can't really plan because I don't really know what that steel is going to cost me because the price keeps going up. And so when, when businesses can't plan for the future, it really is a barrier on their willingness to invest. And it makes them skittish about committing to making an investment because they're not really sure what they're committing to. So it ends up being a real friction in our economy. It's painful for all of us as consumers, but it ends up being a real friction in our economy that impedes investment and holds our economy back. So when we get to 
that's an inflation rate that we don't have to think about. It's a little bit above zero, but it's so low that you really don't have to think about it in your daily lives. That's what we need to get back to. Oh, up here. Dominic's coming. Hi, my name is Gene Megan. A uh, question for you is, do you think that crypto assets and the growth of crypto assets hurts the dollar, or do you think it actually helps people in the United States? I don't think it hurts the dollar, and I don't think it helps people in the United States. <laughs> uh, I think it's kind of irrelevant. Um, it's, just a, it's just a toy. Um, I call it a beanie baby. The other one is, you know, my kids and I like to read and watch uh, Jack and the Beanstalk, magic beans, right? It's possible these magic beans will grow a giant beanstalk, and there'll be an ogre at the top with gold. Um, but it's, you know, 10 plus years in, and it's, what have we learned about crypto in the first 10 plus years of Bitcoin? It's not really useful to buy things. Like, I, has anybody in here bought anything, Bitcoin? I always ask this. I always ask this of the audience that I'm in, especially in college campuses, uh, because it's a test for me. Are ordinary people using it in their daily lives? So, so far, ordinary people are not using it to buy things. It's not a store of value because it's too volatile. People said, well, it's an inflation hedge. Well, then we saw inflation take off, and when the Federal Reserve raised rates, Bitcoin got crushed. So it's not an inflation hedge. It's just another speculative asset. So... Um, I think it's irrelevant relative to the U.S. dollar. Uh, and again, maybe something useful will come of this. Maybe some bean stock will grow in the future from these magic beans. But 10 years on, we haven't seen it. Other questions? OK, well, we've got a couple in the back there. <clears throat> Hi, thank you for coming. My name is Mark. I'm curious, what is magic about 2% versus 1%, 3%, et cetera? Yeah, it's n nothing. The truth is um, we had to pick a number, and most advanced economy central banks have converged around a number that's low. In, it, we want something above zero, and I'll tell you why. Because in the 10 years before the pandemic, we couldn't even get to 2%. We were struggling at around 1, 1.5% inflation, which doesn't sound so bad, but if instead of our target of being two, our target were zero, and we missed on the downside, we'd be in deflation. So your debts would be getting bigger and bigger relative to the assets. So we want to avoid deflation. So most advanced economy central banks have said, hey, 2% is a nice round number. It's low enough that you don't have to think about it, but it gives us a little bit of margin for error. But there's nothing magic about it. It could be one and a half, could be two, could be two and a half, um, but something low and easy to remember. That's frankly how I'd say it. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jason, a not so recent graduate of the University of Montana. I, um, you know, a couple of the questions here touched on fiscal policy, and in essence, we didn't name it that, but education, childcare, things that government pays for, that help the economy go. Um, and that's all driven by how local, state, federal governments tax people. And uh, you know, my perspective on the tax base in Montana is that we have had our economy change without really changing the way that we tax the, the public, right? We had a lot of personal property that was in large enterprises, and we were able to capture this with property taxes. We had a lot of like a large sort of working class that was paying income taxes. We have lots of retirees now who aren't really generating that kind of income. We have, um, and then we have a lot of the industrial base that's gone, which has shifted the, the taxes to a lot of residential properties. So I'm wondering if you see this, uh, something similar going on in other parts of this region, and you know how the Fed thinks about um, the fiscal policy side of things, specifically late uh, state and local government taxation. Uh, you know, we, the truth is we, don't have any recommendations because this is purely the domain of the, the, the public, the voters, and their elected representatives to decide, just as you said, how much to tax, how to tax, who to tax, and then what to spend it on. We take all of those as inputs into our analysis of the economy. 
because uh, it, it matters. I mean, it affects economic growth, it affects competitiveness and whatnot. But in terms of how you choose as the state of Montana to fund yourself, that purely is up to the voters of the state of Montana and your elected representatives. Uh, I'm not supposed to give you advice uh, on that. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's off limits, so to speak. And so I'm going to stop there. I just have a quick question. Hi. I'm JR, and uh, I've learned a lot already. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, it seems like Congress is not concerned at all about our federal debt and um, meeting any t sort of budget. So how does that affect what uh, the Federal Reserve is trying to accomplish? Does it have any effect on that, or should there be some more discussion about our national debt? It could have some effect. Um, ultimately, what determines where interest rates settle out, the amount of borrowing that a government does and what they choose to spend it on can affect interest rates. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, maybe the debt's getting too high. One way countries, one way that shows up for countries if they take on too much debt is the interest rate that they have to borrow at ends up going much, much higher. And so if you look at countries like Argentina is a, repeatedly has had this happen where they ended up borrowing a lot of money, they didn't have the tax base to support it, and their interest rates and inflation all went through the roof. Now, on the, the flip side of that, Japan uh, has about twice as much debt as we have relative to the size of their economy, and they have very low interest rates and they've had very low inflation. So is America more like Japan or more like Argentina? I mean, I would guess we're more like Japan than we are Argentina, but I'd also say we don't want to push our luck. No one knows exactly how much debt is too much debt and where that threshold is. And a little bit of it is a relative game, which is right now America by far is the strongest, most competitive major economy in the world. So relatively, we are way better off than any other major economy in the world. That could change. You know, we could do things that make us less competitive and other economies could do things to make themselves more competitive. And then all of a sudden our relative position would weaken. And so. Ultimately, yes, the government's fiscal choices do matter for monetary policy. It affects interest rates. Um, but again, that's, that's the job of Congress and that's the job of the executive branch. Our jobs are to take that on as an input and then set interest rates, given that, to get inflation at 2%. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Moon went to school here many years ago, retired now. Uh, this may come under fact or fiction, fiction, but there's statistics that keep coming out about corporate responsibility, uh, corporate CEOs, salaries going up 1,200%, the workers going up. 8, 10, 20, depending on what you look at. Uh, do you buy Cheerios for your girls? Pardon me? Do you buy Cheerios for oh, your girls? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> because there's one stat, and it listed about 12 corporations that all their margins are in the B, somewhere in the billions of dollars, but General Mills is raising a box of Cheerios, 18 cents, because of inflation. Thoughts on that? You know, um, I think what's related to the question you're asking is some people have said, well, this inflation that we've seen is because of uh, price gouging by companies. And uh, I have a, it's, price gouging is a complicated concept. And I'll give you an analogy that took me a while to figure out. And I'll just share with you what, what, fi what I think I figured out. I don't know how many of you have taken Uber or Lyft. They have something called surge pricing, where if all of a sudden it rains, people don't want to walk, they don't want to ride their bike, a lot of people call for an Uber or a Lyft. And the price goes through the roof, and the drivers are very happy because they make much more profit, and that balances out supply and demand. So many more people are demanding, the number of cars are fixed, price goes through the roof. So is that price gouging? Or is that supply and demand, price adjusting to meet supply and demand in that moment? I think a lot of what we've seen over the last few years 
is you had this acute event of the COVID reopening. Uh, the services were shut, people were buying goods, supply chains were disrupted, uh, Ukraine, Russia invaded Ukraine, all of that spiraling, uh, shock, you know, sending demand through the roof, and prices had to adjust in that moment. So to me, I feel like it's less about price gouging and it's more about the price adjusting to this mismatch between supply and demand. And as supply has come back online, the prices have come, uh, the inflation has come way back down. So to me, the sign of price gouging would be something that's sustained over a longer period of time, not simply the price is surging when the rainstorm hits. Uh, but it's a very complicated question, and it, it's going to be very market specific. I just gave you a very general answer. Hi, I'm Tammy. I'm wondering how sensitive the Fed is to certain segments of the economy that might be struggling. For example, we aren't seeing it yet here, but when I go to Chicago or San Francisco or Baltimore, I see brand new empty office buildings. And I know that those loans that those folks took out to build those buildings are coming due. And they don't have the occupancy to sustain a refinance, especially with in, uh, higher interest rates. That obviously could have effect on regional banks. So does the Fed monitor that closely, or does it stand back and wait to see what the tumble down effect is on employment um, and just how those regional banks may suffer as a consequence of entering into those loans initially and then not being able to refinance those? We monitor it very closely uh, from a couple of different dimensions. One dimension is we supervise many of those banks. And so we care a lot from a bank stability perspective. Hey, are these banks safe and sound? Do they appreciate the losses they might be facing? How big are those losses? So we look at it from a bank regulatory supervisory perspective, and we look at it from an econ economic perspective. What do we think it means for the US economy? How big would these losses be? Could it lead to a broader economic downturn? So yes, we look at it a lot. We run a lot of different scenarios, uh, but you know, we never get it exactly right. And it's not simply banks that are going to be exposed to this. Some insurance companies are exposed to this as well. Sometimes the losses are spread around in places that you don't see and you don't realize, and then it comes up and surprises you. Just a year ago, we had Silicon Valley Bank get into trouble. Uh, that was supervised in part by the Fed. So even though we were supervising it, we didn't get it all right. And much to our surprise, Silicon Valley Bank getting into trouble sparked concerns about many banks across the country that required us to intervene very forcefully to stabilize and reassure people and, and calm the banking sector down. So yes, we're looking at it. Uh, we think it's manageable, but you know, we've thought that before. So you know, we gotta stay, we gotta stay on alert. Neil, Bryce, Tino Sonora, I'm an economics and finance professor. And uh, on Thursday, before I left for class uh, in the afternoon, the markets were doing swimmingly. Then remember, you're on camera, so let's see what happens. And you made an announcement. This is after the markets have closed today, <laughs> so we're safe. I think we're safe. Uh, you made an announcement that there will probably be potentially no new uh, reductions in the federal funds rate, which immediately sent everybody to the red. Now, obviously, inflation is kicking in, uh, again, potentially with oil prices, et cetera, et cetera. Do you foresee, are you willing to go on the record, foresee two reductions or three reductions this year, or basically stand pat and see what happens over the next few months? So let me, uh, thank you for the question. Let Get me, your brokers on the line, everybody. Uh, this, is, this is where you make the money. <laughs> it's, you know, it's funny, because uh, we live stream these events in the spirit of transparency. And I generally, like tonight, my goal tonight is actually not to make any news. I'm saying things that I've said before. But the comments that I made last week, I had said about a month earlier. There was nothing new in what I had said, but for some reason, people paid more attention last week. I don't know why. So what I said was, my base case scenario is that inflation will continue to fall this year, and I jotted down in March that we would have two interest rate cuts, 25 basis points, over the course of this year. So that was my base case scenario. Then I explained, if we don't see any progress on inflation and inflation moves sideways, then that would make me question, why would we cut interest rates? And then with the, the interviewer, we went through and she said, well, could you possibly raise interest rates? I said, look, it's, I think it's unlikely we would raise interest rates from here, but I don't want to rule it out. If inflation surprises us to the upside, that's always possible. So I laid out three different scenarios. 
I said my base case was two cuts. But the headlines were, Kashkari says no cuts this year. And it's like, <laughs> how did you get that headline? Um, and then, of course, you know, people read the headline, then they retweet the headline, and then the headline becomes, takes on a life of its own. So thanks for the question. Give me a chance to expand on it. <laughs> Sometimes. Oh, I was dovish before. Now I'm apparently on the more hawkish side of the committee. So, so you had said uh, early on that you wanted this to be two-way. Yeah. Uh, so I do want to take the last few minutes and say, we'll ask you a question. So you've been here today. You've heard from people. What are you taking away so that people have a chance to fill in gaps if, if you know, what you're saying you're taking away doesn't match their experience? Well, overall, I think Montana's economy is doing well. Uh, tours, I, what I've learned, which, is, which I think is funny, and hopefully you'll find it funny, that Montanans on average have a love-hate relationship with the show Yellowstone. That you love it because it shows off Montana's beauty, and you hate it because it shows off Montana's beauty, and people want to move here. And a lot of Montanans are like, we like it the way it is. We don't want more people moving here. And that's at the root of this, the number one topic, which I'm surprised hasn't come up tonight, is affordable housing, and lack of affordable housing. Uh, but that really is about supply. And you know, you got to build a lot more supply to address this. There's no way, there's no other solution to this other than a lot more supply. But that requires willingness to have a lot more people moving here. And it seems to me that that's the fundamental like, disconnect that Montanans need to figure out. For your, only you can figure it out. You know, do you want more people living here or not? But if you don't build more homes, Prices are just going to keep going up and up and up and up and up. Um, but that leads to a lot of other challenges. The lack of affordable housing leads to workforce challenges. It leads to affordability challenges with daycare. Uh, a lot of different issues are at the root about housing and that, ex that fundamental question that you all are still wrestling with. Um, but overall, I think things are going well. And uh, that's what I heard this afternoon in some of our meetings. And that's the sense I hear tonight. I'm not hearing uh, a lot of anxiety here in this room tonight, uh, which is great. I'm happy that things are going well. And I love visiting Montana. I always have a, always have a nice experience when I'm here. I don't know. What do you think? Well, you know, look, I was just going to say, you guys have heard me speak. Or some of you have heard me speak. I say the exact same thing. So it's not just me, guys. About uh, housing? Yes. <laughs> you know, and, and well, you know, about the trade-offs, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, the way that I've talked about it is, you know, look, you can accommodate the demand for place by increasing supply, but that new, those new people create new challenges in terms of supply and demand for other things, right? In particular, you know, the line I use is there's only one Blackfoot River, right? So as you add more people, you now have to manage things that you can't expand supply for, right? you know? So housing, in theory, is easy to build, but not all of the things that make Montana special are easy to expand supply. Some things we can't expand, some things we can't do it at all, and that means we have to have a hard conversation about the trade-offs associated with all of it. Yeah. Doesn't mean that we just oh, go build, right? That's one cho choice. Um, it's the choice that I would generally prefer. But, you know, but I also understand that there's only one Blackfoot River. There's only one Swan Valley. There's only one Flathead Lake. Um, you know, and so you, those things, we can't increase supply to match to the, you know, the, if we allow more demand to materialize. So that's the challenge. So. Yeah. Um, does anybody else want to fill in anything? To, you know, is Neil taking away what you want him to take away back to Minneapolis and then ultimately to DC, to DC about issues here in Western Montana? Back there, the back. hand up, all the way. Yep, in the blue. Yep, th yeah. Raise your hand so she can see you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, hi, I'm Emily. I work in housing policy, and I would say it's not easy <laughs> right now to build. Um, probably eight projects I'm working on are all stalled because they just can't pencil with the financing and all of those things. And so um, I kind of have, so I want to share that, that like nothing is moving right now. We had this big push with permits and with building, and we're in a really good spot right now in our vacancy rate and all of that, but it's not going to sustain. It needs like to be continuously built upon. And so that is something that's worrisome. Um, and then I also wanted to ask um, if you can like share any kind of upcoming changes to the market that might influence housing. I'm thinking about like the new settlements with the National Association of Realtors and um, just some of the like chatter about that, that like 
I don't know if that's going to lead to a big exodus from the industry, but also do you think that that will influence rates or um, anything in the existing supply that we have? So. So, yeah, great. I don't know enough about the settlement with the realtors to know how that's going to shake out and what it's going to mean for um, homeowners or rates or costs. Uh, you know, it's funny. People will say to us at the, about, about interest rates, something I do know something about, uh, that, well, you know, you've got these high rates, so we're trying to tamp the brakes on the economy with these high rates, but that's also hurting uh, the ability to go buy homes, and it's hurting, new, it's hurting new supply coming in. And the way I explain it is we think the high rates are a short-term phenomenon to tamp down demand, but eventually, once inflation gets back down, rates will settle out at a probably lower normal level, and then you'll go back to a more, whatever the new normal environment is and supporting supply. But remember, when rates go lower, it does, a, it does help a family afford more, but it also probably means that the prices are going to be higher. And so it isn't obvious that that's a, that's a net boon for a lot more supply coming online. And that's why, to me, when I talk about housing supply, most of it's other factors that are creating these barriers to more supply coming in. It's, it's less of it is about monetary policy. So we have one time for one more. So if, if somebody wants to. Uh... Well, I didn't mean to snag the last question. Please. My name's John, and as, as you mentioned, you were surprised that housing hadn't come up. I'm kind of surprised that in the midst or at the beginning of what promises to be a contentious political year, that politics hasn't come up at all, because I find the role of the economy in a political year adds a tremendous amount of tension to, I guess, everything. Any comment? Yeah, um, uh, fair point. You know, we at the Fed pride ourselves. Our job is to try to make these calls on the economy using the best data and analysis we can, irrespective of politics. And whenever the political heat gets turned up, we all hug the mast metaphorically, of independence, and just say, we got to stay to our knitting, which is not pay attention to the politics. And one of the things is, like, we, we touched on this earlier. Before the pandemic, I was one of the most dovish members of the Federal Open Market Committee. Didn't matter who the president was. Now I'm on the more hawkish side. Why have I made this change? Because the data has changed. And if you look at the committee, people have shifted their positions not based on politics, just because the economic conditions have changed. That's what we're supposed to do, make the best call. We're not perfect. We've made mistakes. I thought inflation would be transitory. It was not. It was, went much higher and lasted longer than I thought. So we're not perfect, but we're all doing our best to make the calls based on the data and analysis and our read of the economy, not based on politics. And so um, that's all I can tell you. I mean, I know we know it's out there, but the best thing we can possibly do is to just focus on our jobs and let the American people decide the politics. All okay. right, I think we have we do have we have two more minutes. We can maybe squeeze one more in. Thank you. Um, just super quick. Uh, last year's uh, minimum wage for Montana was seven uh, seven thirty no seven twenty five, um, which like was. Seven dollars and twenty-five dollar or twenty-five cents, and now it's ten thirty, and so I'm wondering what caused that shift of three point five percent. To, I mean, I'm assuming that some state was. No, so was it's it's uh, it, it was it's it's been indexed to inflation for a while. So at last year it was nine something or, yeah. So 2006. We, yeah, so we've indexed it to inflation. So you know, so it I wasn't see. seven thirty. That's the national. That's the national. The federal minimum wage, and you know, so the the, the minimum wage in Montana just moves with um, some measure of inflation. I don't know I which see. one we've indexed to. Okay, because I just Texas has the same minimum wage. It's now uh, like nine. Uh, it's, yeah, it's like now nine dollars and fifty cents, and so I was just wondering because the population difference versus Texas to Montana and their workforce difference. 
So I think I was just like trying to make that connection. Thank you. No worries. No worries. Well, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, thank you, Neil. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Great, uh, uh, great conversation. Hopefully, you can uh, learn a little bit more about Missoula in the time you have left, and uh, you know, go back and make good choices. <laughs> thank you all. Really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> great. Really appreciate it.